Hello, I'm Bryony Worthington and this is Cleaning Up. My guest this week is Johanna Christensen, co-founder and CEO of the Global Maritime Forum. The GMF brings together high-level stakeholders across the value chain of shipping to discuss long-term sustainability challenges. I first met Jo whilst working on international shipping for the Environmental Defence Fund and benefited from her depth of knowledge and superb global network. I'm delighted to welcome Jo to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe there to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaningup.live. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, please spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Joe, it's a delight to welcome you to Cleaning Up. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. And I'm going to kick off um, really by asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background. Well, I'm so pleased to be here on this call with you, Bryony, uh, this podcast. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we've, we've known each other for a while, so it's really delightful to be here. Um, so my background is uh, actually outside of shipping. So I'm, I consider myself a, a, a newcomer to the shipping sector, even though I've been working in this field for the better part of 10 years. And, uh, and, uh, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Time flies. Um, I, I spent uh, the early part of my career uh, working in, uh, in particular in the interface between public and private sector and uh, looking at long-term sustainability issues and developing uh, networks of uh, companies that wanted to better understand future sustainability challenges and engaging with stakeholders such as governments, uh, regulators, and uh, and variety of other stakeholders around those sustainability issues, what they are, how to address them, etc. So I've done that for a think tank based in Copenhagen. And then I worked for a while at the World Economic Forum, uh, where I helped uh, develop the agenda for the annual Davos meeting, uh, which has become uh, sort of the stepstone to the work that I'm doing now. Um, but I also did some more work, for example, uh, working with uh, stakeholders, especially private sector, in the run-up to one of the international climate conferences, the one that took place in Copenhagen. And it was a huge fiasco. So that was a, <laughs> I think that lit a fire under me to do something successful subsequently. <laughs> so, uh, I think a yeah. lot of people's careers were, uh, were infected by that Copenhagen fiasco. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so to tell us, and so the Global Maritime Forum, I, I've heard you describe it as the uh, Davos of shipping uh, for obvious reasons, right? You came from Davos and, and you, you understand the value of bringing together stakeholders uh, from across the value chain. So do you want to tell us a bit about the GMF? Uh, uh, so the Global Maritime Forum uh, has been around for about seven years. Um, we uh, set it up. Uh, in a way, as a as to create a platform for collaboration for stakeholders across the maritime ecosystem, um, and the background for that is really there's uh, some characteristics of the sector um, that we felt needed addressing, and and uh, uh, some of those characteristics have to do with um, uh, sort of a high degree of fragmentation. It's an industry with many, many, many small players. Um, uh, it's uh, it's fragmented globally as well. Um, it's uh, it's also quite short term oriented. Um, it has a big focus on assets. So the ships that trade goods internationally are uh, are almost like investment vehicles. And so it's got this quite a cyclical. You know, you order ships when the when the uh, you, know, you, so you buy assets when when the market is good but then you get to this oversaturation and over capacity that drives down um the rates and so there's a very sort of cyclical kind of asset trading kind of uh, effects so there's very little long-term thinking really um and then it's also a bit of a bubble and we can get back to why that is but it's it's really the sort of the this maritime ecosystem really is a world unto itself and perhaps hasn't been really um, 
had a lot of look at what's happening in the rest of society and how might that affect how the sector works. Um, so that's that's really one of the, uh, those are sort of the characteristics that drove us to set up the Global Maritime Forum. We are an international not-for-profit organization. We um, organize an annual gathering um, of senior leaders, uh, which you have attended as well uh, when, when you were at EDF. Um, and, uh, and it's really the sort of decision makers in the industry that we bring together. And that's sort of the, the relationship to the World Economic Forum in Davos. I, I really, I hesitate to compare it because uh, Davos is really its own thing. But what, what, what I'd say is that it's a, it's a sort of a mini version of that, a, a mini sort of example of this sort of bringing together high level decision makers to discuss long term issues and work together on developing solutions to address them. That's really the nub of, and then that sparks lots of ideas that where we've become sort of a platform for facilitating sort of some of those collaborations as well. Um, but that's that's really the, the the nub of what we do. And you you mentioned the fact that you feel like a, an outsider despite working in the sector for over ten years, and that that's because it's a it is quite an ancient sector, right? I mean, that's one thing you, that really comes across when you dive into this world is that there are families and businesses that have been plying their trade for for centuries right and it's a sector that's seen a lot of change i don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how the sector sees itself and and some of the things that you know it's been mm. through revolutions before in terms of how it propels itself hasn't it yeah yeah very much so um maybe there are two different elements of that so the one is yes it does does have this long storage Tradition, you know, it's um, been a sector that grew alongside globalization, really, uh, uh, alongside global trade and has enabled globalization in many ways. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's also, I mean, that goes back to the cyclical nature of the industry that it's, you know, it's, it really grows along with trade as well. Um, and uh, and, and that, that gives a lot of Pride in a way that it enables global trade. There's a lot of pride in the sector about that key role that that shipping plays in in an enabling sort of growth in economies, uh, growth in prosperity, etc. Um, and and there are a lot of um, family owned, uh, privately held companies that have been in family hands for generations and generations and generations. And I hesitate sometimes to think that you know, this is the, the previous generations, what those companies might have looked like then. But, you know, for example, on our board, we have an eighth generation ship owner on our board of directors. And, and that speaks a little bit to, again, to this long story of history. But it, it has been through these, uh, through these big transitions. And, and, you know, that's true in particular when we look at the, how ships are propelled, right? So it's gone from, you know, from human power to wind power to coal, from coal to oil uh, and gas, so fossil fuels. And now it's embarking on, a, on another big transition. And, uh, and those transitions are always quite difficult, right? <laughs> so, but I, I suspect that there are some companies at least, or there are some companies that have been at least through one of those transitions and, and maybe several of them, which is quite <laughs> interesting to consider. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the fascinating aspects of it. And, and it's often described as a hard to abate sector, but actually, I mean, I think that might be something of a misnomer because it is actually possible, right? I mean, ships... They, I think they're responsible for ninety percent of all traded goods that they they move around the planet, and but it's it's relatively highly concentrated and relatively um, e well not easy but there are solutions out there aren't there? But I think one of the things that makes the sector quite difficult is it's it's quite a hard space to regulate. You know, the ocean is typically out of sight and out of mind. Um, there's a sort of feeling that it could it's sort of at the fringes of there's there's lots of stories that come out of, of the ocean and out of shipping that, that are kind of high drama. I don't know if you want to say anything about the kind of some of the, the challenges of, of this sector in terms of it being out of sight for large parts of the time. Yeah, it's certainly one sector where I think transparency has come late. Uh, the kind of transparency that we know from other sectors has come fairly late in the game. Um, and in thinking about that question, it really makes me think sort of that um, the sector only really becomes visible when something goes wrong. <laughs> Piracy, we know about, you know, <laughs> off in certain waters and, uh, you know, the, in, in certain parts around the uh, coast of Africa, uh, along the Somalian coast, around the West African coast, there's a, there's, it's, it's, it's quite well known and that there are, that there are big, um, 
that there are uh, security issues, and those are, you know, those are also well known in the popular mind. Um, when ships drop containers in, in adverse weather, uh, when accidents happen, um, there have been some really terrible, terrible accidents in the past with oil spills and the like. Um, but then also some which I think were quite illustrative of its role, its key role in global trade when the Evergreen got stuck in the Suez Canal, right? And suddenly everything that, you know, um, consumers in the US and in Europe had ordered for Christmas got delayed because suddenly the ships couldn't flow their normal trade and whatnot. So, so it really, it, 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 I think the, for, what was interesting about that particular incident is that it really showed and demonstrated there was so much visibility around the sector at that time, um, which it doesn't normally have. And I think what that also does though for the mentality in the sector is that there's a little bit of a, it's not being recognized for the benefits of shipping, which are also enormous, right? As I said before, it's, it's what's enabled um, global trade and thus globalization of um, value chains and, and whatnot. And the fact that we, you know, we rely on, on goods that are produced around the world with materials that are shipped around the world, like all, all of that is possible due to shipping and, and it's very efficient, both from a cost perspective and, and from an environmental perspective, nevertheless. But it also is under the radar. And so um, the unseen sector, it's also unseen emissions because they're not, you know, they're not part of the national registries and the like. So uh, it's a, yeah, <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, it, it, it has some, some adverse effects as well. That is that it remains quite unseen. And transparency is one of the big issues that we're looking to address as a global maritime forum as well. So, so but it's got, but because it's such an ancient um, part of the global economy and so important, it's actually got its own uh, global organization that, that creates a, a level playing field, really, a, a rule book that's a global rule book. And, and I guess that that's, dates back to the foundation of the International Maritime Organization, headquartered in London, uh, back set up in the 1950s. And, and that's a sort of almost an asset, right, that, that we have this global regulator that looks after the sector. I don't know if you want to say a bit about how important the IMO is in, uh, in this sector. Yeah, I think there are a lot of sectors that actually envy uh, the fact that, that shipping has this global regulator, especially when we face such a big challenge as, as decarbonizing a sector, right? Because it really can create this level playing field. And we've seen the IMO also act really decisively in situations where there was a crisis. I mentioned this idea of, of accidents before. Um, so the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which some will recall, uh, if nothing else, then in sort of the imagination uh, or will be aware of happened, uh, led to regulations that were rolled out actually really quickly. Um, so uh, new requirements on how ships are built. They had to have double hulls into, instead of single hulls. And that, that happened really quickly. So having a global regulator that can really go in and step in and set new requirements uh, for the vessels that plow, sh uh, plow the sort of the seas, I think that's a, that's a really important role that the IMO plays. But you mentioned before this idea of shipping being a hard to abate sector. And, I, and there are some reasons for that. So it, it's not... It's not one-sided. Uh, to some extent, you could say that uh, why is it normally bucketed in with the hard-to-abate sectors? Well, there are some good reasons for that. The one is that there's a really a fuel switch required. Um, it's not a sector that can easily be, ships can't easily be electrified except for really specific circumstances. Um, then it's also, it's quite hard to pass on the cost. There's a um, a, a challenge that we see in other sectors as well around sort of this landlord-tenant dilemma where those that pay for the savings of new investments into more e efficient technologies aren't the ones who necessarily reap the benefits. Um, so, so that, and yeah, so there are various, diff various different mechanisms that mean that that's one of the reasons why it's considered a hard to abate sector, nevertheless, even though it does have um, this global regulator and which a global regulator that really has stepped up recently in terms of uh, delivering a framework for change. So, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we're going to come back to, I think, the question of how do you decarbonize uh, the shipping sector with technologies? But just sticking with the IMO for a second, that it always struck me that what was quite fascinating about the IMO was that the power balances there are slightly different to normal UN negotiations. And, it, and it's because of this uh, question of flags of convenience and the fact that that gives prominence to countries which are sometimes not they might be marginalized in other un or G, gx conversations but in the imo tiny little nations that have got lots of vessels flagged 
uh, in their nation, it gives them an outsized voice sometimes, doesn't it? I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, it, it might be helpful to put a little bit of context around it. Like, why? what is that? What's that about? Yeah, yeah. what so, is the flag of uh, What's that all about? So, so basically what it means is that, so... Um, some of the big ship owning countries and they are still important so let's not uh, let's not diminish their importance but the big ship owning countries are china greece japan the us norway singapore germany korea like those are big economies that where um uh so most of them are big economies uh, where there's a high con concentration of ship owners but under imo regulations uh ships can be flagged elsewhere in other countries that offer so called flags of convenience and what that means is that there, at least in some parts of the industry, has been a drive towards uh, flags that have less stringent standards and the like. So it's, it's a way of um, decoupling where the ownership of the vessels are and, uh, and where, what regulatory regime applies, if you will, or what regulatory framework applies. Um, and... And uh, I, it, in a way, it would be a little bit if you were building a factory and you were allowed to have the ownership of one country, but you, it was regulated by another country, right? So, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, an odd construct. But the most of the ships are, are so it's it's quite fragmented still. Um, but big ship on uh, uh, ship flags, countries uh, that have a lot of ships flagged uh, under their hood, so to speak, are Liberia, Panama, the Marshall Islands. Hong Kong, Singapore again, the Bahamas. So <laughs> there's not necessarily a, a direct overlap with where the where the um, where the ownership is. And what it means that those countries that have a lot of ships flags have traditionally had quite a lot of influence at the IMO. So countries like Panama or the Marshall Islands have traditionally carried a significant influence in the negoci negotiations because they're going to have to implement the regulations that happen there, right? And they have an interest in um, in the outcomes of the IMO, in addition to those where the where the ships are owned, um, so that's a that's a different dynamic, right? Well, and and I can remember that um, when I was working on shipping while I was, whilst I was at Environmental Defence Fund, um, the Marshall Islands uh, was was in particular had joined the dots as a, a very vulnerable nation to climate change, and there was this wonderful Environment Minister Tony De Bruyne who was bringing climate change into the discussions in a way that was really quite forceful. And do you think that helped shift slightly the dynamic? Because as you say, it's been a sector which has been slow to take on these bigger, longer term challenges. Yeah, it's certainly played an enormously important role in the context of the greenhouse, the initial greenhouse gas strategy that the IMO adopted in uh, 2018. Um, the influence of the Pacific SIDS led by the Marshall Islands, was enormous in, in um, holding other nations to account to come up with a strategy that uh, shipping had been left out of the Paris Agreement because it was seen as particular. <laughs> it's a little different. There's a, there's a concept known as shipping exceptionalism, and this is one aspect of it, right? It's a little different. It's global. You need a, globally level, you need a global level playing field, yada, yada, yada. So for that reason, it was held out of the Paris Agreement. And so it was incumbent on the IMO to come up with a framework that somehow matched. Of course, this initial greenhouse stress, gas strategy was not at all aligned with the Paris Agreement. But nevertheless, uh, countries like the Marshall Islands and other Pacific uh, SIDS played a big role in getting that initial agreement across the finish line. And that was sort of the impetus for a big conversation in the industry and a big movement within the industry towards its decarbonization. Because even the goals that were set back then meant that the sector is going to need to undergo a fuel shift, uh, a complete switch of the fuels that it's using and 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 now of course we've just had and we can get into that like i suppose is uh there's been a new agreement right and uh, and a ratcheting up of of the targets uh that have been set uh most recently um so just to just to explain a little bit uh, uh at the imo they uh, there was a meeting in july where a new and a sort of uh strategy was adopted um, so after an initial greenhouse gas strategy was adopted in 2018, a lot of work had gone into, you know, what, how, how will we reach these goals? Um, and uh, the strategy was finalized and adopted in July. And in conjunction with the adoption of the revised greenhouse gas strategy, it was actually significantly ratcheted up in terms of its, uh, its terms, if you will, its targets. So um, specifically, it went from halving 
of global emissions by 2050 to now fully zero emissions or by 2050, right? So that was a big jump in ambition. And is it true that in shipping, really the interest of the sector is to properly decarbonize? They're not they're not offsetting, are they? They want true zero, and now they're aiming for that by 2050. That's that's quite a big jump. What what, what do you think led to that sudden increase in ambition? Um, so yes, it is a huge jump. Um, I think one of the things that has led to that jump is a line of sight on um, on what the solutions might look like. What at in 2018 looked much less clear. Uh, now has really kind of come to the fore and understanding, okay, what might that transition actually look like? And I think another big thing, honestly, the factor is that, you know, the effects of climate change are already visible. A lot has happened since 2018 in understanding the deepening climate crisis in which we live. And, and so that has also um, led to a, a sort of a renewed impetus, if you will. Um, and then finally, there's been a, a lot of, activists and others that have really spoken to this misalignment with the Paris Agreement and why one sector should be allowed to stand outside of that. I think that's been, there's been misgiving, misgivings and rightly so around that. Um, so making sure that the sector is, is more in line with the objectives set by the, um, by, by the Paris Agreement. It's not fully there, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, and one of the things that was exciting, in addition to this sort of the 2050 goal, is there was some interim targets set as well that have been, uh, that, are, that are really good. And sort of, so it gives not only an end goal, but a sort of a trajectory of how to get there. And, and I mean, and the thing, I mean, I suppose the, the difference between the IMO and the UNFCCC, for example, is that shipping is used to setting rules that are enforced, right, that, that are regulated. And so it, it, the part of the slowness is the fact that it's not voluntary. It's, it's an actually legally binding commitment by on countries. And, and so the status of the targets, though, is still that they're part of a strategy. But we're now expecting legally binding policies, right, and measures to come in. Is that correct? Yes. So alongside the objectives, so the strategy, there was a, a work plan has been adopted for when legally binding regulations will come into place. And there's a schedule uh, effectively over the course of the next year. There's going to be a, a sort of a set of meetings and each one of those has some specific goals as to which, which measures will be adopted at which time. Um, and so by the end of next year, we should have the legally binding regulations and they should enter into force by 2027. So that's the timeline that we have. So it's it's quite a it's quite a tight timeline, if you will, if you think about especially what the sector at which speed it normally moves. So, so this is uh, this is really exciting, uh, and uh, and it's it's really exciting to see how how quickly it has gone from sort of uh, something that was deeply misaligned with the Paris Agreement to something that's much more closely aligned with the Paris Agreement, and then this schedule of uh, regulations that are that that's sort of going to be coming uh, down the pipeline over the course yeah. of the next year. And, and yeah. those those actual measures then to get to the targets, and there is a target set for 2030, right? So uh, at least an objective uh, uh, to get to, to a reduction in 2030. They're, they're going to take on different characteristics. There's likely to be a measure that's addressing fuel standards, right? Or, or, or something about the CO2 content of, of fuels. And then there'll also be likely a, an economic measure, uh, a measure that creates a kind of price, a carbon price that people can invest against. Is that, is that am I interpreting that correctly? That there are these likely to be two two measures that we get on shipping. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. And they are, and they will be. The, the idea is that they are that the that they will be pegged against the sort of the the trajectory that's been agreed upon, right? So they need to follow the sort of they need to be have the effect that we reach the objectives that have been set by the strategy. So yes, that's absolutely correct. So a fuel standard and the, and some kind of economic tool. And there are lots of different ways to skin that cat. And I'll leave it to the policymakers at the IMO to, to come down on what will be the most suitable one um, uh, of these different, but, but they will be a, a combination of technical and economic measures. So, and they're, they're comparable to tools that exist in other contexts as well. I mean, a fuel standard is not, it's not, a, it's, it's not an unknown instrument. It's something that's uh, been applied to cars. It's been applied to, you know, in other contexts as well, right? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a known entity. And once it's in place, you can sort of very, fairly quickly see the market re respond to that as well, which is, which is quite interesting and why we really look forward to those measures coming into place. And then there are some other aspects that sort of, 
you know, there's a, there's that kind of that trajectory of the, the sort of how we get to zero. But then there are also some additional targets. So one of the ones that we find quite interesting is there's a, a target to achieve five uh, percent, um, five to ten percent um, zero uh, or near zero um, propulsion um, by 2030. So the way to interpret that is it's basically a 5% zero emission fuel uptake <laughs> by 2030 is, is effectively the objective that's been agreed upon. And that starts giving like really tangible, okay, that's a certain amount of fuel that's needed of, of zero emission fuel that's needed for shipping by 2030. So how do we get to that, right? It gets these, gives us these really concrete things to work towards because it's specific volumes, uh, specific timelines, and, and that, that allows us to sort of start unpicking um, what needs to get done in order for us to achieve that, which, you know, I mean, 2030 in, in the context of an industry with assets that have 25, 30 year lifespan, that's, that's, that's not a lot. It's or tomorrow. indeed like the infrastructure yeah. that exactly that's tomorrow was well, kind of yesterday yeah. actually. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, but just, just sticking on the economic measures that, I mean, the reason this is needed, and we're going to come on to talk about the particular ways in which you can switch fuels, but it's because almost anything you do is going to be more expensive than burning heavy fuel oil, right? And heavy fuel oil is the kind of bottom grade of the barrel. It's it's kind of pretty filthy stuff. It's cheap. Um, and that's what the industry runs on, by and large. Um, there's been some shift into gas, but it's not. It's still predominantly oil oil fired. And and that 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 price difference is huge, right? To, to go from something that's dirt cheap where you're paying and also you're paying absolutely no tax on your fuel like aviation fuels uh, shipping and aviation fuels don't pay any VAT or income tax or anything or any tax on on their fuel use so to get to close the gap between these new fuels which are going to be more expensive and the, the cheap fuels that are used today there's gonna, it's going to need quite a hefty economic instrument but I suppose one thing I'm interested in is that just as we've done in the power sector Whilst we might need a two hundred and fifty dollars a ton levy or, or carbon price to actually close the gap, you don't need to levy that amount of money on everyone, right? You can put a much smaller levy on everyone's purchases and then aggregate that up and pay it out to the people who are prepared to make the early investments. The people who are going to take the risks on the first of the kind, uh, they can be they can be given a, a subsidy or or a contract for difference even that helps close the gap. So so you can get to a two hundred and fifty dollar a ton carbon price but that doesn't that's not you know not everyone has to pay that amount right yeah that's exactly right and indeed to be completely frank i mean we're you know obviously the 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 end objective is to have that economic instrument Im, uh, implemented at the imo but some of that can even be done in a regional or a national context um because for the first movers to move they don't necessarily need a global regulatory scheme right so there there can be um certain schemes that are implemented on specific trade lanes or in specific geographies to support those first movers so that they can get out the gate, right? And and sort of pave the way for the rest to follow. Um, and so, so so that's that's one of the really exciting things. And you're absolutely right. It is relatively small when you think about the scale of the change that is needed. Um, uh, and yeah. So let's let's get on to this discussion then about how do you switch out heavy fuel oil or, or LNG as it's being used some, in some ships into something different. And and the, there are pluses and minuses of all the options that are out there, right? And um, I, I wonder if we can just quickly discuss, I mean, we've talked, you've mentioned electrification and, and the electrification obviously is the solution for land-based transport. And, but it's, it's a lot harder when it comes to long distance ships, right? The ferries, the short haul, they are electrifying. I've seen an electrified tugboat. I've seen electrified ferries. But it's we're really here talking about international global shipping and, and the, the really biggest vessels. And their electrification doesn't work. So we are looking at a, an alternative form of propulsion. And it groups into a set of alternative fuels. And we can also maybe talk about nuclear as well. Uh, so anyway, over to you just, just to tell, give us a flavor of what are the leading options when it comes to switching out. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, what we can't do on board the ships, I think we can do on land, which is electrification, right? And and so um, pretty much all the fuels that are that are seriously in consideration for fuel switch for uh, the maritime sector are 
electricity based, they're green hydrogen based, right? Well, I say electricity based, and, uh, you know, there, there, there's a different categories of blues and greens and whatnot. So of course, some could be produced in different ways, but, but the, but effectively, the, all the fuels would be um, pretty much hydrogen uh, derivatives. Um, and the two leading contenders at this stage are ammonia and methanol. And let me start with methanol, perhaps, because that's actually in use already. And it's it's really interesting to have seen how quickly this has moved, where a technology that was seen as quite out in the distance is now is now in operation. The first methanol powered ship has uh, been delivered. It was uh, it was named earlier this year, uh, actually just a few months ago here in Copenhagen, where I'm uh, based. Uh, and it's now in operation and running on methanol. Um, and there are many more ships actually on order um, to uh, run on methanol uh, in the future, the, the, many of them being delivered over these coming years. Um, the uh, distinct advantages of methanol are just that, the technology readiness, right? And it's a, it's a fuel that's uh, pretty well understood. Uh, it's uh, easy to handle. It has an existing regime already in place because it's been under development for some years. Um, the ships that run on methanol, they can... Um, well, the ships that is now running on methanol is a new build, but ships can be readily, uh, relatively easily retrofitted to run on methanol, and uh, and so there's, those are those are some of the opportunities. But there are also some challenges, and the biggest challenge is that it's uh, it is produced using steel, so it's a net zero. Well, on a well to wake, it's a net zero a fuel, uh, and it uses uh, a carbon. You need carbon to produce it, right? So, uh, and there are some some concerns around the scalability of the fuel and what that means in terms of the cost. Um, so, um, and that's particularly so biogenic cost and then where, where shipping will compete with other sectors to use some of this for, um, for example, with aviation and other sectors who might be able to pay more for this fuel. And that's why ammonia is often seen as a long run solution for, uh, for the shipping sector because it doesn't have those same because of molecule constraints, if you will, <laughs> it can produce be produced purely using um, green electricity, right? Um, and and that's kind of the potential of ammonia as a fuel. Yeah. So so um, this is, so, the, so yeah, as the, well, I'm just I mean so the so you, the, the the real challenge then is with methanol, uh, a known substance, you know, relatively easy ship owners are comfortable with it, but the feedstocks have to be sustainable because, as you say, mm -hmm. it's taking a form of carbon. And that once burnt, it releases that carbon back. So it has to come from a biogenic source, and that's going to compete with maybe uh, food production and, as you say, sectors who can perhaps pay a bit more for, for a fuel that they really need, like aviation. But if we think about um, an ammonia, which is essentially a carrier for hydrogen, right? It's NH3. It's a, a way of moving hydrogen around or using hydrogen. And because it doesn't have any carbon, there, there are no carbon emissions. That, that's the, the advantage, right? Right. And so from that perspective, and it, and it has a cost. So again, the cost comparison with methanol comes out favorable in, in the long run. Right. But it has the challenge. Well, it has multiple challenges right now. So the one is on the technology readiness, although I will say a lot has happened even these past few months. So the first engines are re reaching um, the sort of the operable in principle phase. Um, the first vessels are being ordered. Now they're not, or rather sort of the high level, I want to reserve a slot to build, to, you know, in order to build a ship eventually down the road when the engine is ready, right? So that those sort of slot reservations are beginning to happen. Um, so there's a lot happening right now over these months with, uh, with technology readiness um, uh, and sort of the vessel orders and interest into ordering vessels with uh, ammonia powered engines. Um, but we've got a lot to do still on the regulations and safety because, of course, the big, big, big challenge with ammonia is that it's highly toxic um, and highly corrosive and flammable. So those are those are not great things. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the advantage is that that it's it has been used, right? As fertilizer, it's you know it's been used and handled around. It's, it's transported already. It's an, it's a commodity that gets traded already. There's existing ammonia infrastructure that could be used for these initial trades. But it, but it is one that hasn't been used and applied in the context in which it's, it's looking to be applied. And so we need to make sure that we get the regulations and the face, uh, safety regimes in place so that it can be that it could be used safely in shipping.
and there's lots of work ongoing in that. So regulatory regime, uh, sort of the regulatory authorities in Singapore, Rotterdam, and some of the other big port cities that are also big bunkering hubs, so fuel hubs uh, for shipping, are right now in the process of going through all these mechanisms. The engine manufacturers, the shipbuilders in Asia are also uh, working full steam ahead to make sure to have the techno technologies ready and making sure that they get approved and that you have all the sort of the safety regimes in place around the vessels so that they're ready to go from later this decade, probably around 27, 28 is when we're expecting the first ships to go uh, fully in inter into operation. Um, there might be a few ex examples that I started earlier, but that's, yeah, but that's sort of the timeline that we anticipate there. Well, that, that's amazing because the last time I looked at this was uh, 2019 uh, when the Environmental Defence Fund did a deep dive on ammonia for shipping. And, the, and our, I mean, you've mentioned many of the advantages, but one of them was that it doesn't need to be stored at cryogenic levels like hydrogen does. Um, and, and it because it's NH3, you can, you can fabricate it using green electricity, as you described, which could be coming from abundant solar and wind resources. And then it just needs to be combined with water and air. And then you've got a fuel, right? And and it's uh, and it's a drop-in substitute for diesel in many engines, right? You can blend it, you can you actually adapt an engine to take full ammonia. And then it's got the prospect of fuel cells uh, and, and down the line, which would be even more sustainable once the costs come down uh, on fuel cells. So so it it seemed to have a, a good path, but as you say, uh, it's not a nice substance to have to handle, and it also does create NOx, so you need NOx abatement technology. So there isn't; a, it's not perfect. But also, in terms of storage, I, as I understand it, it takes about four times the volume of fuel because it's not as carbon; it's not as energy dense as the heavy fuel oil they're currently using. So you, you do sacrifice some of your ship to larger fuel holding tanks, which brings me to my one of my favorite topics, which is uh, is nuclear, because I'm right that um, now because of the targets and, and because this 2050 goal is now a true zero goal for shipping, there's been a resurgence in interest in, in whether we could adapt some of the military uses of nuclear propulsion for commercial ships. So is that, am I right? Or am I being too optimistic? Uh, <laughs> it depends who you ask, I think. <laughs> but yeah, let me, but can I just, if I'm, if it's okay, I just wanted to make sure that we're getting the facts right. So it, it's, Ammonia and methanol are half as dense as, as regular fuel oil. And I think in most cases, what is anticipated is that rather than saccharized cargo space, it's about refueling more often, basically, right? So, so it has definitely some, some implications, but it's not as dire as all that. So I think the biggest thing is, is really the cost and safety are, are, the, are the biggest issues, both for methanol and for, and for ammonia. Um, but you're right. Uh, there has been a resurgence in interest in nuclear, and there, there basically there, there are two things that are being looked at, and and I think they probably are in different timelines, is how I would assess it. One is around nuclear for producing the fuel, so power to X, so power, you know, using it to pr produce the fuel, whether it's methanol or ammonia or whatever it might be, and that goes on board the ship. Um, and the other option is to the other opportunity is directly on board the ships. And of course, one can see why that would be tremendously attractive because it's super energy dense. Um, you base it's like it's like putting a, a battery that never dies or very rarely dies onto your ship. You can just stick it on there, and the ship can probably operate for the majority of its lifespan on that one on that one uh, small modular reactor, which is I think the technology that's that's most sort of thought about for this application. Um, and it also means that the ships could probably go quite a bit faster than what they do today. Um, ships generally travel significantly slower in order to save on fuels and lessen on emissions. Um, but with nuclear, you could you could go much faster, and it could be more efficient from that point of view as well. Um, and you know the the waste product could, for my, my understanding, is that for the waste product, the small nuclear reactors can probably be repurposed, reused, recycled. I don't know what's the right terminology. You probably know better than I do. Recycled, I think. <laughs> so, so it does have a, a sort of a these inherent benefits that are incredibly attractive. Um, and it, it's, it's, <laughs> there are big buts, right? <laughs> no, there are there, are, there well. are some big buts, but it but it's worth pausing just to say that um, obviously large vessels, including the entire fleet of aircraft carriers in the U.S., are currently powered with. 
nuclear reactors. I mean, obviously, it's a military use, so the costs are not as critical. Um, but the security of it and the and the reliability of it and the ability for it to move large vessels long distances reliably, that that's kind of proven. The big question is whether it can be done in a commercially cost efficient way. And, and I guess the acceptability of it uh, in terms of people being happy with it and, and that but that, that feels to me less a technical challenge and more a social challenge that that would need addressing well there are some technical challenges as well right so and and i think you probably know more about what the what the readiness level of these sort of more modular concepts uh, looks like but you're right so there's cost from my point of view there's there's a bit of like the readiness of the technology is it you know the i think the proponents will speak of it as you know it's in this decade and that might be true on land but for ships like i would say the application is probably a little further down the line more like 15 years or something like that right 10 15 years down the line um and and i i do think that there's a sort of a social acceptance or perception issue around it and there's a huge regulatory implication as well right because ships do go all over the world and for some of the ships for whom this would be particularly attractive they 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 trade globally um and uh and they are under a uh, as we've discussed before with the IMO under a regulatory regime but one that nevertheless differs um depending on where they're owned where they're flagged etc so there are there are, there are certainly some concerns that are that are that are valid to raise um i think that's true of any uh, anything that's going to be have potential harm human harm associated with it right and that also yeah. applies to ammonia as you say that, that also applies to ammonia absolutely absolutely i think the difference with ammonia is that it's that it's um uh, that it's a, a commodity that's already traded right so it's already fairly well understood whereas with nuclear i think the commercial application is is nevertheless is uh, is a more challenging one um but yeah but it's it's definitely worth keeping an eye on because we too see that in enormous uptake in interest over these these past yeah. years yeah. yeah, one of my favorite facts that perhaps not a lot of people know is that the U.S. had a commercial nuclear fleet, uh, nuclear ship called the HMS Savannah. Uh, which I, was in, I know. Yeah. <laughs> which, you know. And there are, like, there's a Russian uh, uh, bulk carrier as well. So it's yeah. it's not that it's not been done. It's just whether or not it could become widespread and, and affordable. Yeah. That, those are the questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway, let's, yeah. because Fair rather much. than spend too much time on... <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, there's a couple of, well, one last question, actually, that I wanted to, to touch on because it's important, um, is that there's a paper that's just come out, um, and it's back to the climate challenge uh, from Jim Hansen, Professor Jim Hansen, who's kind of, you know, the person who perhaps did most to bring climate to our awareness decades ago, um, who has been looking at the recent spikes in, in climate impacts and looking at the effect of having taken sulfur out of our fossil fuels but not the co2 so both on land in terms of coal burn we've cleaned out the sulfur because of acid rain and shipping as is it, as is its uh, tradition was a little bit slow and it took sulfur out um quite recently and there's a there's a kind of a non-trivial risk that having taken sulfur out which actually has an effect of cooling because it produces a lot of particulates that can that, that can defray some of the warming. That having taken sulfur out but not CO two, we might have made a bad situation even worse. And I I wonder for me that just signifies how important it is that we we do everything we can to catch up on the on the on the carbon on the CO two problem that shipping has because we might have just done the world's worst thing, which is clean up those. Those, those particulates, but not to address the greenhouse gases. I couldn't agree with you more. I think for me, it really speaks to the urgency that there's, we really have no time to wait. I think the other thing that's worth, and that I think that spills into this other conversation of some of the alternative fuels that are in play, it speaks to unintended consequences, right? So being mindful that when any solutions that we look at, that we look at them in a holistic point of view, and that we really think about all the potential sort of uh, knock-on effects that they might have, and and understand those well, and really look at it from a systems perspective. So those 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 two things are are for me the key takeaways um, from from that latest finding. But the effect, the, but it comes also back to the fact that the reason we were able to take sulfur out is because we have a global rule setting body, which is the IMO. So if the IMO does um, follow its timetable, which is quite aggressive to get these measures in, and they're they're investable measures. And we see the the front the front runners who are taking the risks being rewarded, and then technologies come down the cost curve 
there's no reason why this sector couldn't become once again a completely clean way of moving goods around the world supporting development supporting trade supporting economic growth and and then everybody can have full pride in being part of the shipping sector because i feel like there's still that pride but there's also a sense of feeling like they've been under a lot of criticism nobody likes to see the black smoke you know that when a cruise ship or a big carrier comes in you know you can see the impact it's having visibly right and it probably is it's not now impossible to think that we can get rid of that 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 sort of guilt or shame that shipping perhaps carries and move to a fully clean system and that's that's presumably what gets you up in the morning and keeps you excited yeah most certainly so i mean i think the progress and, and this is something that's when you uh, i think for me has been one of the most rewarding parts of working um with the global maritime forum and in the sector is how big of an impact the work can have right um the potential for impact is just so huge. It is, in some ways, a contained system, even though it connects to the rest of the world and to global trade. But nevertheless, it's a it's a finite number of vessels. It's a finite amount of fuel that needs to be switched out, that needs to be replaced. It has, you know, and, and there is this enormous, and there's an, a sector that's really keen and willing to take the steps that are needed. And, and that's so exciting to see that play out and see how rapidly it moves. So that's what makes me super, super excited about being part of the sector and 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 really being able to see how quickly it moves. And and you can really, there's line of sight on, on this. Now, obviously there's no guarantees about how we make it happen, but there really is. Like I, I sense the, the sort of both the urgency in the sector, the pressure that's on the sector to change, the regulatory re regime that's moving past, technology is moving past, like all the conditions are right for the sector to actually make it happen in a way that's so hard to see across other sectors, right? So so that's that's super exciting. Um, and where we can really see the speed matching the need, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's, and that's, uh, that's, that's a big and as you said really early on that that is the envy potentially of other sectors right because you've got a technology that can move and you've got a rule setting body that can help it that can help defray the costs and, and make this affordable and if you were sitting there in the steel sector for example you'd love a body like that right to level the playing field get rid of all the competitiveness distortions so yeah uh, so so perhaps we end with a bit of you know, hope and excitement and, and praise to the fact that this is a sector that's, that is now moving and has a regulatory body to help it on its way. And as you say, national governments are also helping. So uh, it's an exciting area. Maybe we'll, we'll come back to it in a future conversation and see how it's going. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it probably, we probably don't need to wait that long to understand the big shifts that are already happening. I think there's a lot of concerns also, though, and I think that's worth just hitting on as well. Which is around will the fuels be available, right? I'll, you know, I'll feel the dream style. If I build the ship, will the fuel come? So, so it's also dependent on developments happening in other in other sectors, in particular on the green hydrogen front. And we've seen obviously national policy, uh, industrial policy play an enormous role in accelerating developments there, bringing down the costs and whatnot. So, and um, it's a a mix of sort of concern and and some. And, and lots of optimism. <laughs> well, no, thank, thank you for ending with that because, and I'm sure this will make Michael smile, is that you know Michael has been you know instrumental in bringing about this idea of the hydrogen ladder, that there are certain uses for green hydrogen that should take primacy in our discussions, in our policy, in our, in our investments. And shipping is one of the top options for use of hydrogen. It's, it's one of the places where it makes complete sense, especially if you convert it into something like ammonia, where it's then even more easy to, to handle and store. The, 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 the problem is that at the moment, we've got a sector that's looking at hydrogen as the kind of Swiss army knife for every solution. And that might be actually being de detrimental to getting it across the line in the places where it's really needed. And so perhaps we should uh, pay tribute to that hydrogen ladder and also get uh, you know, leave with the message that this is this can happen, but we need to focus, right? And we need to make sure that we're applying those new fuels to places where they're most needed and where they can be most readily adopted. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I and I encourage Michael to keep banging on that drum because I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Don't worry, I think he will. <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we're going to wrap it up there. And um, so thank you so much for your time. And uh, lovely to catch up with you, Joe. I hope we can see each other again in real life, uh, at a, hopefully at a GMF meeting. Where's the next one going to be held? 
the next one will take place in Tokyo in October of next year. So that's also really exciting. It's an interesting nexus where this sort of convergence between industrial uses, power sector, uh, decarbonization, uh, maybe the nuclear debate as well. It's, it's going to be a, a great place to have a lot of these discussions and, and sort of a, a major shipping nation as well. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to that. OK, thank you so much again and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Thank you. So that was Johanna Christensen, co-founder and CEO of the Global Maritime Forum. And as always, we'll put links in the show notes to particularly interesting materials related to this conversation, including the recently announced IMO strategy. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And do please, please spread the word on social media or by telling your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.